The title to this video is uh, Day of the Dove. We need some peace, right? Lots of conflict. The uh, Battle of Charlottesville, Virginia just happened. There's all kinds of anger and hate and, and, and vitriol on both sides. And uh, I've been a peace activist now for uh, approaching 10 years after I woke up to the 9-11 the false flag. And <clears throat> when, when you study how the adversary engineers war, uh, you're able to see through the nonsense. And one of the greatest teaching tools that I, I ever came upon was uh, a video. Uh, it's actually an episode of Star Trek called the episode is called the day of the dove and that's an allegory about how you can heal uh, conflict which is engineered by a third party so in this uh, allegory I actually posted it on my wall on Facebook uh, you could check it out it's it's like a 12 minute synopsis of a, a video uh, or an episode a TV show called, called Star Trek from the 60s and 70s I guess and um, so anyway, it takes place in space and they're on the USS Enterprise and the, the long-term conflict in that allegory was between the, uh, the Star Trek people on, uh, versus the Klingons, right? So um, they were kind of, the Klingons were another race, you know, in space, but you know, you had the human being people, but you had Spock, who was another race. He's like half Vulcan or whatever he was, right? So anyway, all that stuff. So there's this conflict. They were they're warring. They're on the ship, and they're actually uh, uh, fighting with swords on the ship, battling and battling. And there was a uh, there's this little there's this light that you know when they're fighting whenever they would fight the the this light would grow bigger so so it's like a uh, think of a psychic vampire the more hate that there is the the glow of this orb would get bigger and bigger and bigger right well the analogy is is this third this alien entity this third party interloper this usurper of goodwill it's analogous to the money lenders or the usurers or the Rothschilds because the more they can divide and conquer us, the more their power grows because the only way a tiny, tiny minority, you know, we're ruled by a tiny, tiny, tiny minority of people, right? It's 7 billion debt slave versus like a thousand money lenders. So strategically, if, if you want to win this war, you have to understand uh, that number one, we're being warred upon, that this war is being engineered. And in the same way that, you know, think of how Great Britain, this tiny, tiny little island was over to, was able to uh, subdue India. India is enormous. Well, how do they do it? How does a tiny, tiny country like Great Britain go into India and take it over or China right because they t conquered China to a great degree as well how do they do it there's a strategy that they do they use over and over and over again and it's divide and conquer and they go in there and they look at the different groups like oh okay we're gonna get these guys hating these guys and we're gonna get these guys hating like and then we're gonna we're gonna finance false flags and, and counterintelligence programs. We're gonna do Operation Gladio, look that up. We're gonna do uh, all kinds of uh, initiatives to divide and conquer the people. All right, so they have a strategy. We can have a strategy to overcome that. We have to stop being so stupid and falling for the same trick. The same, they're working from the same playbook over and over and over again. And the thing is, we have to acknowledge part of the uh, capture, the, the, the uh, rescue. Yahweh wants to rescue us if we're willing to. Rescue, rehabilitation, release. How do we get to the garden? All right, so we're going from conflict, 
how do we go to the garden? That's the goal. How do we go to the gar garden? So watch that episode. So I want to just explain that the reason why we have such chaos is it's actually coming from Yahweh. We're, we are under a curse and a captivity. Um, okay, I'm reading from Deuteronomy 28. Um, so if you listen, we have the blessings. If we rebel, we have the curses. And by the way, the U.S. Constitution is polytheistic, therefore we're under the curse. And the, and the Lord shall make thee, so this is part of the blessing. This is Deuteronomy 28, 13. And Yahweh shall make thee the head and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. It shall, If thou shalt hearken unto my commandments of God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. Uh, but, uh, okay, down to 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou shalt not hearken unto the voice of, of Yahweh, to observe all, that, all of these commandments, then all these curses shall come upon thee and overcome thee. All of these curses are applying to us today. This is relic. It's hard to believe. I mean, because this is 4,000 years old or, you know, uh, 3,500 years old. Cursed thou shalt be in the city. Cursed thou shalt be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of the body, fruit of the, the land. Um, the flocks of the sheep. Cursed thou when thou comes in. Cursed you're going to be when you go out. Um curses shall be upon uh, coming with vexation by the way what's the, the think of a vexation think of the hex we're under a hex 666 the hexagram 666 vexation and rebuke and all thou settest thy hand to do so whatever you dream to do it's all going to be destroyed and and you're going to perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings whereby thou hast forsaken me um God's going to make the pestilence cleave unto thee until uh, he have consumed thee off the land, wherever thou, go, wherever thou goes to possess it. We're going to be dispossessed. And Yahweh shall smite thee with a consumption, with fever, with inflammation, and with extreme burning, with the sword, and with blasting, and with mildew. They shall pursue, and they shall pursue thee, thee until thou perish. So whether you're on the left or the right, you're both in rebellion. All of us are in rebellion by serving this wicked system. And thy heaven that is over your head shall be brass, and the earth sh under thee shall be iron. Um, uh, the Lord shall cause thee to be spitten uh, before thine enemies, and thou shalt go uh, out one way against thee, and flee seven ways before them, and shall be removed from all the kingdoms of the earth. And thy, and thy carcass shall be meat unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the earth, and no man, man shall fray them away. The Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt, and with emeralds, and with scab, and with itch, and you won't be healed. And the Lord shall smite thee with madness, and blindness, and an, an astonishment of the heart. Right? So we're going to be turned blind and with madness. This is really big. The, the Lord, Yahweh, our creator, the creator that created all of the magnificence of the heavens and the earth, when we are polytheistic, whoring, he's the, the cause of the curse. It's his diabolical genius which we're fighting, right? Do you want to fight Yahweh's diabolical genius? The inventor of the eye, the inventor of the brain, the inventor of mountains and heavens and landscapes and oceans. Do you want to go up against that God, that creator, and say, oh, I got the Constitution, we got this. <laughs> Again... And Yahweh shall smite thee with madness and blindness, blindness and astonishment of the heart. That's Deuteronomy 28, 28. Madness, doing the same thing over and over again. What, what's going on in, in, uh, in uh, Charlottesville is just a reenactment of Operation Gladio, 
It's a reenactment of the Cold War. It's a reenactment of uh, the, the seeds of the uh, World War II, which Yahweh engineered on rebellious people. And thou shalt grope at nobody. Sorry. And, 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 and thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways. Thou shalt not, thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. Thou shalt betroth a wife, and another man will lie with her. You hear what I'm saying? Your wife's going to go cheating on you just because in the same way Yahweh's wife is whoring on him. Like, you want to be a whoring bride? I'm going to make your wife go whoring. Thou shalt build a house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Think of that in, uh, you know, in Summit County. There, there, there's guys building houses all over the place in Summit County, but they'll never live in them. They can never afford them. The average price of a house in Summit County is a million dollars. The average home value. So you have all these guys who are contractors building houses and they're never going to own one of those houses. Thou shalt build a house and thou shalt not dwell therein. And thou shalt plant a vineyard and not gather the grapes thereof. Um, so it goes on. I just want to establish that uh, and go down the... So into 43... The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high. The money lenders, this alien group from the, the episode of Star Trek Day of the Dove, this is this an allegory of the usurers, the money lenders. Okay, so I want to relate this to scripture. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him, lend money. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee, and thou shalt and shall pursue thee, and overtake thee, until thou be destroyed, because thou had hearkenest not unto the voice of Yahweh, to keep his statutes and judgments. And by the way, keeping his statutes and judgments includes... Uh, obeying the feasts of Yahweh. People, we've been so brainwashed and trained to do the exact opposite of what pleases, you know, if, if we want to be a bride. <laughs> I guess I'm just, I'm kind of talking more broadly. If, if we want to have peace, We've been taught to do the opposite of what is necessary in order to have peace. We've been taught since birth the opposite of truth. We've been taught the opposite of what to do to have love, real love. Because our love is thin. It's based upon physical and material. You know, if, if uh, the ultimate thing a father can do under Babylon is, you know, buy stuff for his kids. Like if, you know, the, 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 the duped dad of Babylon. The Bible says, if you love me, the, the duty of man, if you love me, keep my commandments. Because if we love Yahweh and keep his commandments, we won't have the curses. We won't be the tail. We won't be duped by these money lenders into perpetual warfare. Where most... Where most don't even see it. There's such blindness just, just like Yahweh commanded. Just We are fighting against God. <laughs> Do you, do you understand the futility of that? <laughs> but when you have, but when you have uh, the eyes of Yahweh, where you can see and you can hear, you can understand what He does with His prophets. Is He, 
if if he can trust us to obey and and be his voice he wants to teach his people how to overcome the curse that he created I mean it's real simple if you love me keep my commandments it's it's all in Deut just read Deuteronomy 28 the blessings and the curses now I, I just imagine if you went up to a, a hundred Christians today and say hey brother are you under a curse they would say oh no I'm free in the Lord you know I it's impossible to enslave uh, uh, any Christian who, who has read the King James Bible, right? That's what uh, that's what Baptists have brain brainwashed to believe. They've been brainwashed to, be to believe that the Bible is the infall the inerrant word of God, right? Totally brainwashed, just totally brainwashed. Meanwhile, they've been brainwashed to believe that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, like just epic epic, mind-numbing brainwashing. All over the place. It's on the left, the brainwashing, the right, the brainwashing, in the church, the brainwashing, outside of the church, brainwashing, in the schools, brainwashing, in the colleges, brainwashing. It is everywhere in Babylon. Brainwashing, brainwashing. It's in the Hebrew Roots Movement brainwashing. I mean, this, when Yahweh says, I'm going to put a strong delusion on these people, he was not playing even a tiny little bit. The episode of Punked is, is from the Creator. This episode of Punked that we're living out, the, the, the diabolical, ingenious nature of this episode of Punked is from the creator of the madness. I just read it right there. The curse comes from Yahweh. The evil comes from Yahweh. It says it right in Isaiah. You got to use the King James. Otherwise, it just says uh, afflictions or something like that. All this that is afflicting humanity right now comes from the Creator, right? So think of like the, the most pleasant thing you can think of, like an orgasm, right? Pleasure, pleasure, right? So it's physical pleasure. The, op the Creator of the orgasm also created the curses and the strong delusion and the madness. And if you think that you're going to beat that through protesting, <laughs> through the U.S. Constitution, through continued rebellion and whoring, you are just, it's just more blindness. If you, if you think you're going to overcome that with weapons and hate, on, on either side, blindness, 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 the blind guides, hypocrites, blind guides, the blind leading the blind everywhere. And that's why it's Yahweh's plan. It's part of Yahweh's plan of, during the periods of captivity where evil has run, run amok to send prophets who have the anointing of the cannabis of Exodus to give people the vision to see how to get out of the captivity, to see how to get out from under the curse. So again, we're talking about the, uh, Linda, there's an episode of Star Trek, that's my sister, there's an episode of Star Trek. When I was growing up, I, I uh, my brother-in-law, at the time was my sister Linda's husband named Patrick Henry and I grew up uh, my first job was with her husband Patrick Henry at a coin shop and I, I worked at this coin shop on the weekends where we'd go to uh, I think it's Doylestown Doylestown Pennsylvania 
uh, in Amish country to a flea market where during that time it was like, uh, I don't know, like 1977, 78, 79. And at that time there was an inflation spike and the price of gold and silver spiked. Silver went all the way up to like 50 bucks, I think in 79 or 80 or whatever, where the Hunt brothers cornered the market. And um, so anyway, people were bringing in their common, uh, their piggy banks, they're breaking their piggy banks because only, uh, you know, like up to 79, there was silver in the dominant currency, uh, in the clad, half dollars for instance and um, so people in their regular piggy banks they're coming in with their piggy banks and breaking them and I would go through you know I was only uh, like 12 years old at the time 12 13 whatever and I would sort sort through the coins so these this whole manipulation of economies of humanity through the bank bailout of 2008, the bankers have been gaming us for thousands of years because Yahweh has empowered them to do it. <laughs> Yahweh has empowered them through the curse of the moneylenders, which I just read. And since they have unlimited funding, they have unlimited money to empower people with ideas, bad ideas, like Adam Smith with usury. So they create capitalism. Say, oh, look what a great idea capitalism is. Hey, look what a great idea capitalism, which is just Jewish, fake Jewish usury. That's all it is. If you look in the Bible, there's no, it never talks about capitalism. <laughs> there's no such thing. Surely, if it was a good idea, Yahweh would have said, Yahweh just says, what is a good idea? What is good? What are the good things to do? Do what I say. Have no usury. So if the money lenders come forward and they have this great idea that's based upon usury and they just rename it and they call it capitalism, is it a good idea? No, <laughs> it's not a good idea. No matter how cleverly they market it, no matter how many flags they put on it, no matter how many constitutions they lay over top of it, all of these layers of deception, if they call it Austrian economics, if they call it uh, free market, if they call it freedom, you know, if they, if they just, all they do is they, they put a strong, a strong delusion over top of it. So now you have capitalism like and they say okay let's just go spread capitalism all over the world usury by money lenders usurpation by money lenders so think if you're an a, the hawaiian people you're the hawaiian people and you're like you have, you have heaven on earth basically you're kicking it in hawaii you have sovereignty you know you go out in the ocean like there's there's surfing everything's all good and uh you know captain cook shows up <laughs> And say, hey, hey, good news, everybody. We got some capitalism for you guys. <laughs> and, you know, of course, the, you know, they're, you know, they're primitive to a degree, right? And they show up with cannons and like, uh, I think this is, what is this, like 1850? So what technology, you know, shortly they, you know, they've got cameras and wireless and trains and hey, we're you primitive savages. Don't you guys don't even have uh, gunpowder. <laughs> Look how advanced we are. <laughs> In the meantime, these people are living completely self-sufficiently on the land harmoniously. It's all good, just like they did to the American Indians and all that kind of thing. So they come in with capitalism and just wreck everything, <laughs> right? And then it's all wrecked and the people get angry and, 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 and they, they're, they're all turned into uh, uh, day laborers, right? Just like me, you know, they're making bricks for Pharaoh all of a sudden. They're all, everybody's 
uh, who, who formerly were just, uh, you know, they every day they'd get up and they'd just be with their families, they'd go fishing, um, they'd be with their wives, they'd raise their children, and, and uh, you know, they had money like the American Indians, like wampum or whatever. Um, well, originally that was the tribes of, of, of Israel. That's how they were living, self-sufficient, self-sufficiently on the land in tents, come to the feast of tents, Breckenridge, October 6th and 8th, get back to the ancient ways, but we can still have technology. Okay, so the point is, with clever marketing, they come in and say, oh, we, you know, we got all these gadgets. Now we've got, you know, a cell phone, you can communicate all over the world, blah, blah, blah. But if the underlying foundation of that is not built upon the rock, you're building your future on quicksand. Rebellion, right? So anyway, thing, everything's going wrong. The people turned into uh, uh, debt slaves. Now they got J-O-Bs, just over broke. They're all debt slaves now, working for the money lenders, just like Yahweh commanded that aliens would be usurping you. Well, back then, uh, you know, just to relate my, my sister's story, we, we were watching this story, a uh, uh, TV show, and I used to watch Star Trek all the time with Linda and Pat. And back then, I never, ever, you know, I wasn't a peace, a peace activist. I didn't know anything about that. In fact, I was going to be a Marine, you know, like my uh, family was all in the Navy. Um, so... This is a, a, a regular TV show, but there was a lesson uh, in it in Star Trek because the they were always fighting the Klingons. Well, in this one episode, they actually have peace. And that's what we all need. We need some peace. And peace in the Bible will only come with the dove, <laughs> the prince of peace, and obedience to his morality. <clears throat> uh, but in the Star Trek episode, the way they stopped the conflict is the more they fought, the more the power of the alien grew. But when they started laughing at it, they started laughing at the alien, the power diminished and he just, they ran them off. They, they, they cleansed the temple. They, the, the money lenders went away. So watch that episode. And... So getting back to the Hawaiian people, um, so now they've got jobs and Babylon is promoting the destruction of their, their culture through capitalism, just like it is today. Um, well, roughly at the same time of 1850, uh, because Europe had already been uh, destroyed with usury, uh, and people were protesting and getting angry and they're just going, hey, just, we don't want these jobs. We don't want to, I don't want to leave my family just to go work in your, your factory. This, this sucks. So they, they created a loyal opposition movement called communism. And it was promoted by the bankers themselves, the users themselves. Uh, the users were fake Jews and they pr they promoted, it was promoted by this guy named Karl Marx. And his father was a rabbi. Um, who did Jesus fight? Rabbis. Why was Jesus, why was Jesus fighting rabbis? Because the Bible is a history of a people that got corrupted. They got corrupted. They obeyed originally, all 12 tribes originally obeyed, including the Jews. In fact, it was the Jews who obeyed the longest. They fought the money lenders, the usurers, the longest. And because they fought the devil, because they fought the synagogue of Satan, because they fought the usurers the longest, the synagogue of Satan has since stolen their identity and turned it into the identity of the very people that was their arch enemy. So now most people, including myself for a very long time, identified the Jews as being the usurers. 
And that identity theft is exactly what Hitler played upon. A whole nother usurer financed initiative. That was a whole nother bank operation. All World War I and World War II were all on all sides financed by the moneylenders, including Hitler, including Stalin, all factions. And until we understand that the bankers, all wars are banker wars. All wars are divide and conquer strategies by the uh, tiny minority called the moneylenders. These conflicts are engineered. And Yahweh <laughs> equips his people with the vision to see right through it. You can see it, like lots of people can see right through it. All right, so my background is that I was a warmonger, hedonist for the vast, vast majority of my life. But when 9-11 happened, um, I, you know, back then I was still blind to it, but it, when the bank bailout happened, then I started investigating just for my own uh, self-preservation that these guys are gonna print a whole lot of money to fix this. So I started, because I had a decent amount of money back then, um, I owned the pool business. I had installers all over the Southeast. Um, I wasn't building pools anymore. I was driving around in an RV with Robin and we were just, we had the life of Riley basically. So, I mean, at one point we were in Argentina scheduling pool installations, just sending texts to the workers. We would be in Colorado uh, RVing and, and my witness is that I was in the Rockies it, at, in, in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and uh, I initially, um, well, let me back up a little bit before I had my cannabis um, calling, <laughs> um, was that I just knew they are going to be printing a lot of money in order to fix this bank bailout thing, and I wanted to preserve the money that I had uh, protected from inflation, so I started investigating, investing in gold and silver. And then I had seen that they had confiscated uh, gold in 1933 under a direct order, a actually a presidential executive order. You can look it up. This is not conspiracy theater, uh, uh, theory. It's conspiracy fact that the money lenders owned, owned and directed FDR to confiscate all the people's gold as part of a bankruptcy in 1933 and turn all the gold into the private for profit company called the Federal Reserve. The, the FDR has no authority to tell people <laughs> to turn their private property into, to, into a bank. Right? Imagine uh, Donald Trump said, hey, everybody's got to turn their cell phones into the Federal Reserve tomorrow. That's what it's analogous to. Everybody's got to turn their, their cell phones and their televisions into the Federal Reserve tomorrow under penalty of a $10,000 fine. <laughs> right? Well, that's exactly what FDR did. And he didn't... You know, it wasn't turned into the government, right? It was turned into a private company, right? <laughs> That's a bankruptcy. And, and everybody should recognize that part of a bankruptcy, that means the creditor, the borrower is no longer in charge. The creditor is making all the decisions, right? Well, who's the creditor? This private company called the Federal Reserve. I mean, this is... This knowledge is almost a hundred years old. I mean, you're only willfully ignorant if you don't want to investigate these things. The bankers are in complete control of our society. And even that lying thief, lying thief 
and, and, and deceiver, Ron Paul knew this. His brother actually had a video that he made in like 2008. Ron Paul had a brother, or he, I don't know if he's alive still or not, called, uh, his name's Wayne Paul. So at the time Ron Paul is running for president, Wayne Paul was making a video saying that, hey, the president is just a, a, a figurehead. The president's just a puppet. This is, a, you know, this is a hundred years ago almost now, you know. <laughs> In the meantime, we're fighting over who the, who the, who's going to be the next puppet president. Like, come on, people. This information, I mean, this, the, these lies are just so huge. What, what's his name? Alex Jones was making videos about this in 2008 when Obama was running. In the meantime, he's he's promoting. So he's so double-minded. He's saying that the pro, the president is just a puppet. In the meantime, he's telling you to vote for Ron Paul and 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 Donald Trump, right? Alex Jones is a loyal opposition bank agent. Everybody who's telling you to vote is loyal opposition because there's no voting in the Bible. Voting never ends the curse. But our pride won't allow us to acknowledge these very, they're simple, they're, you know, they're difficult to digest, but it's a very simple lesson. God is in charge. And since we've gone so far into rebellion, there ain't going to be any peace until we come correct. Until God married a bride named Israel. A, a peculiar people that, are, that, that promised that they would obey. But the devil has lied to the whole world as to who the Israelites are. There's massive confusion as to who the Israelites are. So the very people that the vast majority of the world perceives as being is deceived into believing, have, has the strong delusion that Yahweh promised. They're the opposite of those who want to obey. The people in the Middle East that call themselves Jews they're the opposite. They, they track their genealogy through their mother. They hate the laws of Moses, right? Think of the one people on the, the planet, right? Just, you know, if you just look at this from a, a, an outsider, forget everything that you ever learned, learned about who the Jews are and just read the laws of the, of the Old Testament that say no sex before marriage, uh, no nudity, no, uh, nobody gets married other than men and women, um, no usury, no perpetual debt, no voting, and then, then you look at the world and see the people who promote the opposite of that. What are, what are the group of people on earth that promote the opposite of all of those things? Is it the Muslims? <laughs> <laughs> right? The Muslims don't promote the opposite of that. It's the people in Hollywood who are promoting the opposite of that. It's the people on the TV who promote the opposite of all of that. And why do they do it? Right? It's Walt, the people in Walt Disney right all of a sudden you have these girls who are you know disney girls and they just turned into mind controlled whores like just disney's and britney's and lindsay's or you know all these little uh babylonian whores the kardashians right what does babylon lift up what does babylon put you know so another thing Babylon does is it goes, oh, those these guys are wicked, but they they keep they keep them around, right? Like the Nazis, right? In order to have conflict, you need to have the boogeyman around. You need to have your 
you know, you need to have your Osama bin Ladens and uh, Saddam Husseins and your Hitlers and your David Dukes and your uh, Jesse Jacksons and, you know, you, 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 you got to have your race baiters on both sides, right? If you're going to engineer conflict, you, you need to have some bank puppets around so for the bank puppet theater. You need to have the big names show up, right? Babylon has a story. It has theater. And the only way you get out of that theater and that, that puppet show is to look at it with disinterested eyes. You got to look at it at a, from a 30,000 foot view. You got to look down with God's eyes and see with and look at it with disinterest. Okay. So this guy, Karl Marx, gets financed by the very same bankers, the very same money lenders. Who are in rebellion. So I, I want to be very clear to distinguish a guy like Karl Marx versus a guy like a, 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 a benevolent Jew like Nehemiah and Ezra, right? Because there are righteous Jews in the Bible for certain. And that's a big thing that people get tripped up on because uh, some people have been brainwashed to think that Hitler, uh, there's a lot of revisionism going on. Um, and they say, oh, look at, look at the good things that Hitler did. He fixed the economy. And that's why, um, that's why he was being targeted by the West and by the communists. And we're a communistic country now. And Hitler did a bunch of good stuff, blah, 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 blah. Hitler was a puppet the whole time. I mean, he was Time's Man of the Year. <laughs> <laughs> time being controlled by the fake Jews, right? You got to have your boogeyman in order to have chaos and war, right? I'm not saying he didn't have some real good marketing and he didn't give lip service to certain uh, things in order to bait people in just like Donald Trump baits people in. But Hitler was never, never saying he... Uh, Hitler was never ever saying, oh, you know what we got to do? Is we got to read De Deuteronomy. <laughs> We're under a curse right now, and we got to go back to the ancient paths. Hitler was never ever doing that. Alternatively, Nehemiah, the Jew, did do that. And Nehemiah led a debtor's rebellion. This Jew fought the usurers. Hitler did not fight the usurers. Because the way you fight the usurers to overcome the curse of the money lenders from Deuteronomy 28, 43 through 68, to overcome the curse, the Egyptian captivity, where we're all bond servants today, just like we were 3,500 years ago, it, it explains it all right in there. However, our pride, our strong delusion, our ego, our vanity, our spiritual blindness won't allow us to see it. But this is a deep lesson for prophets. If you, if you want, if you truly love peace, if you truly want your children to live in peace, To, for us to beat our swords into plowshares. For all of us to, to all humanity, black people, white people, all humanity to return to the garden. There's no rebellion in the garden. So that, that comes upon, like, so... I'm faced with this realization, um, you know, I want to thread my own journey into this. So I'm, 
you know, it's 2008. I'm living the life of Riley. I'm basically a libertarian at that time. So like, hey, you know, sodomite, you know, go have sodomy. I had a vasectomy at the time. Um, I had abortions, multiple marriages. Like I'm just, you know, compared to the, the morality of the Bible, I am just as wicked as they come. I was a constitutionalist at the time. Um, Ron Paul kind of guy, generally. Um, so just as wicked, thinking that we got to vote Ron Paul in. So it's like 2008, 2009. <clears throat> um, so if you came to me then and say, hey, Wayne, you know what the real solution to all this is? We got to get back to the Bible. I'm like, what you talking? How does that even relate to any of this? We've got bankers run amok. That's not, like, we got 9-11. These guys fake 9-11. What does that have to do with the Bible? We got to fight these banker guys. It's totally unrelated. What, what does, what does my sex life have to do with 9-11? They're completely unrelated. This is my my carnal mind. What does my having abortions and a vasectomy have to do? I had a vasectomy for 15 years. What does that have to do with any of this? We can we'll just fight the bankers by, you know, we need gold and silver money instead of the, these Federal Reserve notes. Once we go back to the original intent of the Constitution, <laughs> that's what we need. The Federal Reserve is, that's unconstitutional. All right. So I want to uh, explain my own personal journey from being a 9-11 truther and wanting peace, which I did, and, 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 and committing, because I was committing my soul to fighting the bankers because I got really angry that they would fake wars because my whole family volunteered for these wars. My whole family, extended family, my, my, my brother, my mother and my father, uh, myself, we were duped and I got angry. You know, if you get punked, don't you get angry? <laughs> right? And it was no minor thing. It was willing to completely die for a lie. So I got angry about how I would look at people who had uh, military members who had lost limbs lost lives. I'd look at Arlington Cemetery I'm like, wow, they faked the Gulf of Tonkin. They faked. And my dad thankfully warned me or I had, uh, and my, my father saved my life and told me how uh, FDR faked Pearl Harbor. Engineered completely. And, and uh, the United States put an embargo on Japan. That's an act of war. Imagine China put an embargo on a military embargo on both coastlines of the United States. Or, or, or think of China put a military embargo with battleships or aircraft carriers around Japan. That would be an act of war. Well, that's what we did, the United States did to Japan. We started the war. They just never described that in the Jewish, the fake Jewish controlled papers. Controlled by usurers. So all, everything that we're hearing right now about the, these incidences going on in uh, uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, that's through the filter of the usurers. Mind you, the u usurers control fascism, capitalism and communism. So no, no matter which one of those you pick, <laughs> no matter which one of those choices you select, 
including a constitutional republic, you're choosing the usurers. So when Yahweh says, I'm going to put you under a curse and I'm going to give you blindness, pa-pow, you got blindness. And his prophets are sent during a time of this captivity where lives are being lost, families are being destroyed, and say, hey, I've got a real simple message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's fast. The curse can end quick. The captivity can end quick. The mark of the beast can end quickly. All we need is a song. We can sing a song and overcome it. Laughter. We just laughed. If you know, if if, if we have, you know, why why Jesus says, um, "Love your enemies," because the people who we have been brainwashed to think are our enemies are actually just other people who who have been brainwashed by the very same people who brainwashed us. We're all brainwashed in Babylon. We're all, all deceived in Babylon. Everyone who rebels from Yahweh is deceived. All of us today going to work for the usurers are deceived. All of us. And we can come out of this mass delusion this dark theocracy. We live in a dark theocracy. Yahweh proclaimed it. He promised it. And the part of this understanding to acknowledge this uh, this captivity is to just recognize the simple truth is that we're under a curse. If you want all of the steps of the solution, if you want all of the steps, the first step is rescue. So if you refuse to be re rescued, you can't even go on to the release. So it's rescue, rehab, release. Rescue, rehab, release. Most people won't even acknowledge if, if, if I was given the floor between, in front of a hundred Christians, 99 of them would not even be willing to fully be rescued. And that's the first step. Very first step is you gotta be willing to go through a process to be a mono, monotheist. Meaning, the Constitution ain't gonna save you. Capitalism ain't gonna save you. Uh, you know, gold and silver isn't gonna save you. Bitcoin isn't gonna save you. Even a usury free money system all by itself isn't gonna save you. It requires surrendering to his will in all things, not just the money system. I was focused alone on just fixing the money system, but it's bigger than that. Yahweh's looking for a bride who obeys him and stops whoring and doing what's right in her own eyes, her own mind, not just with respect to money, although that is an, an enormous portion of it. That's one of the most challenging aspects because individually it's, it's, you know, like the Hebrew Roots Movement, they're good with obeying the feast, they're good with obeying uh, the Saturday Sabbath, um, they're good with uh, not eating the unclean, but they have no interest in, in, in getting out of the interest-based money system. They're not willing uh, to defy acts of Caesar because they lack courage, basically. 
because then all of a sudden you're going up against Pharaoh directly, right? They lack the courage to defy Pharaoh. Um, that's why I say to them also, uh, you have to fully be willing to be rescued fully well, be willing to be rescued. And man, people just... Ego, idolatry, we just don't want none of it. So yes, yeah, Star Trek Day of the Dove. Um, it's an allegory for how one of the steps is to just laugh at how we have been deceived in so many ways to believe that the Constitution um, is sacred and holy. So if, if, if you apply this to the, the, the people at, you know, on either side of what's going on with uh, um, the whole battle of Charlottesville, Virginia. So, because I was a 9-11 truther, I have a lot of people that I have friends with and have been an activist with, uh, with 9-11 truth, that are uh, kind of on the left side of the spectrum, some that are libertarians, and some that are on the right, like Ron Paul, anarchist kind of people. Um, and then some of them that are even uh, like alt-right. I have some friends on Facebook that are, are like black nationalists, that they just they just think all all white people are the blue-eyed devil, and I, I can understand why they see that way, and I try to reach out to them and just say, hey, uh, what I say to them is that you know at what age does a child become evil? Because when they're born, they don't hate anybody, <laughs> you know. So at what, at what age do, do, does my son become just evil if you hate all white people? Just like some people hate all black people. Um, so it's just this madness, madness, madness on all sides. Um, and, and, and the people who believe that uh, white people are the blue-eyed devil, like they have a, a lot of good evidence to support that. They can look at the world and, and go, you know, it's, it's white people who are, are committing this mass genocide, this institutional racism, which causes poverty in Africa and uh, economic disparity. It's all, it's all these white bankers at the top, like, there's no, you know, Jay-Z only gets so high in the Illuminati ranks. There's no Jay-Z uh, Federal Reserve Chairman. They're all uh, fake Jews. For the past three, like for roughly the past 40 years, all the heads of the Federal Reserve have been Jewish. Right? So the black people look at, look, they're all white. <clears throat> They think Esau, because Esau is red, they think of red-haired people, they're white people. So they think um, under that narrative that they are Jacob and Esau is killing off Jacob under that narrative, right? So it's about race. Um, so this racial, they, they use the Bible to support their race, racial narrative so it's just confusion and hate and confusion and hate confusion and hate when God is just looking what what determined in, in the curses of Deuteronomy and the blessings that the, the, the distinguishing factor in the curses is simply obedience the qualification it wasn't about race it didn't say hey if you're uh, if you're black you'll have these blessings. And if you're white, you'll have these curses, right? 
it didn't say that. It didn't say if you're, um, if you're born Jewish, you'll have all these blessings. But if you're born as a Gentile, you're going to have all of these curses. So it wasn't over race, it was over obedience. The blessings and the curses are established over a single litmus test question. Obedience or rebellion? Exactly as found in the Garden of Eden. As exact, it's in the New Testament as well. It wasn't, this isn't just an Old Testament idea. The king Jesus Christ of Nazareth obeyed. Right? In order for him to be the sin sinless, unblemished lamb, the Passover lamb, he had to obey. <clears throat> so, H Henry Garman, have you ever watched that video, uh, 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 Star Trek Day of the Dove? where they all just turn around and they, they laugh at the usurers, the alien among them. They laugh at the money lenders, right? I mean, it's, it's amazing how uh, it really fits perfectly. Because um, right in Deuteronomy 28.43, it says the, uh, the alien among you or the, uh, the, the enemy who is within thee, you know, that language it uses. Um, so the Bible uses that, that language of, of the alien who's among you or the enemy who is within thee. Um, so you think in, 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 this, in this day, how you would apply that to uh, the, the Hawaiian people, right? Who, who's the alien among you that's lending you money? the Rothschilds, right? If you're in Africa, who's the alien among you who's lending money? That that they have the 666 star of Remfam on, right on the money, right? Who are the money lenders? The third party outsiders. Is it Hawaiian people lending money to Hawaiian people or is there some far foreign government, foreign corporation, foreign entity? that's ruling over you. I mean, if, if you have spiritual eyes, you'll see it everywhere, right? No matter where you go, if you're in China, <laughs> who, who's the money lenders, right? If you go to the American Indians, who's the foreign money lenders? They're, they're not American. Who's lending the United States, the whole world, the whole planet, regardless of its shape, is ruled by these money prostitutes, these money pimps that turn us into prostitutes, that we, we got to go get our J-O-Bs, our just over brokes. And because of that, all of us are prostituted prostituting our minds and our bodies and our souls in order to survive in Babylon. That's all that's going on. Real simple lesson. And because these money lenders monopolize the money, they are able to uh, finance ideas and market them like communism. Or capitalism they take ideas and then they promote them Catholicism um, wh whatever you, you name the idea technology technology is gonna save us bitcoins gonna save us when in fact all God is doing is giving you another carnal idea that you can go make some money, you can go sell your soul and rebel from God with the constitution. Right? Why do why do people why do people believe that the constitution's a good idea? Right? 
if you looked at it with disinterested eyes, you know, if, if you weren't emotionally attached to it, that, you know, from, you know, grade school and everything, why do people think that it's a good idea? You know, if you just looked at it from an outsider, well, who wrote it? Well, Christians didn't, it was, they, they'd never used, the word Jesus isn't in the Constitution. It's a polytheistic document. There's no voting in the Bible, but there's voting in the Constitution. The Bible has no requirement for majorities, but there's a requirement in the Constitution that you can't do anything without a majority. Right? But Yahweh says, yeah, Yahweh's having cuts. Gideon had a cut. Ah, uh, you got too many. You got too many cowards. Get rid of the cowards. You can't do my work if you got cowards. Gideon had a cut. I think it went from 300, it cut 200 down to 100. The majority, the Broadway, is cowardice. He's looking for a few, many are called, few are chosen. Tiny, tiny few like Henry Garman who keeps it on point. Recognize all of, all of the, 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 the deception of the all powerful Oz, right? That's all Babylon is. It's bluster. It's, it's theater, bank puppet theater. So you have capitalism, Jewish usury, fake Jewish usury, communism, fake Jewish usury, fascism, fake Jewish usury. Because if these movements were really fighting the bankers, what would they do? They would do what the benevolent, righteous Jew did Nehemiah, and they would say, I pray thee, leave off this usury. And they would round, the, 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 hey, brother, I don't hate you. Let's uh, unite together against the money lenders and get rid of the usury, get rid of the sin, because that's the only way we can end the curse. The only way we can end the curse is to have debt forgiveness and land repatriation. Give the First Nation peoples of the world their lands back. We can't sleep while our beds are burning. Let's give it back. Bum, bum, bum. Henry Garman, I, I posted uh, that video, Star Trek Day of the Dove. When I uh, edited it at that time, um, I was trying to uh, bring the message of peace through monetary reform uh, to Jews and Palestinians. Because <clears throat> you have this long, uh, ongoing fight where most people think it can never end. This is an allegory between uh, Jews and, and Palestinians. By the way, many of the Palestinians are, are Christians. I think it's like 10%, 15%. And we have to realize that the synagogue of Satan doesn't really have much intention of ending their rebellion. We have to force it upon them. Similar, uh, similarly to what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah, the righteous Jew, actually fought the usurers. Whereas the, most of the people who label themselves as being bank fighters are pro-usury. The vast, vast, vast majority of people who say, you know, I want to, you know, we need to end the control. The bankers are controlling everything. The vast, vast majority of the people who label themselves and acknowledge that the bankers are engineering conflict that the, the, uh, um, all even people that say all wars are banker wars so they'll say that but in the meantime because they hate God's morality they'll be pro usury think of you know most of the people at the all right thing you know we're talking about the uh, 
the Battle of Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. <clears throat> stuff. Just deception. You know, if you want to fight Yahweh, Yahweh's going to win. <laughs> you Just expect more war, conflict, hardship in your personal life. Uh, war and conflict on the, you know, the in our communities. War, more war, conflict internationally. That's it. So what the prophet's job, they, they, they are charged with the responsibility of turning the, the hearts of the fathers toward their children. And what we say to you is, with the voice of Yahweh, do you love your children more than being labeled alt-right? Do you love your children? Which do you love more? Do you love your ego? Do you love the Constitution? Do you love your carnal self? Like for me, like do you love uh, being a, a misogynist, like being a skirt chaser, being, you know, having abortions? Do you love uh, having, you know, just being hedonistic and being a drunk? Do you love um, just, you know, doing whatever you want? What, what do you love? Do you love your child more? What, what do you love more? Do you love peace more? Or do you love that you can just sleep with whatever sex you want? Right? That you can just marry whatever sex you want. What do you love more? Do you love peace more? Which is more valuable to you? And I'm, I'm pulling up to the truck stop. I'm going to pick up Jim and I'll have him pick it up. Um, because you, you do have to pick a, 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 a code of morality. Um, there, there's no middle ground. There's Babylon is offering a morality code and The synagogue of Satan is offering a, a morality code, and and the morality code of uh, Babylon, the dark theocracy of Babylon, has a morality code. They can, you know, do what thou wilt, do whatever you want. I I got a gas up if you want to pick it up. Um, um, I'm I'm basically uh, the the title of the video is uh, Have you ever seen that video of Star Trek Day of the Dove? call it uh, basically just real simply I need to do a review for the video anyway it's basically the long-term conflict in the Star Trek series from the 70s 60s and 70s is that they were going out and exploring new worlds and their their chief rival was the Klingons all right and they're always fighting the Klingons over and over and over again. Oh, like it was like, so you can apply this conflict between white people and black people, between the left and the right, and uh, between Palestinians and, and uh, uh, the Jews and, and um, you know, fighting over the land, all that kind of stuff. Well, in this episode called The Day of the Dove, right? Uh, hint, hint, hint. Um, on the ship, the Klingons and the Captain Kirk people, they were fighting with swords. They're literally like, even though they're in this land of all this technology, they're fighting with swords, right? Because somehow their, their technology was neutralized. And they showed there was this orb, this third party, this alien, just like it says in the curse of Deuteronomy 28, 43, the alien among them, it grew. Whenever they're fighting, it grew bigger and bigger and bigger, right? like parasiting their energy if they were hateful it would got bigger and bigger and bigger but then Spock goes apparently when we're fighting each other um, the orb grows larger right and he says um, under that rational thought perhaps what we should do is declare an armistice and just try to laugh at the orb 
right? So they all, all start laughing at the orb, and the orb shrinks, 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 finally to be banished, and it just left because it, the, the, the magician's trick ended. That's all this is. And by the way, the curse comes from Yahweh, the creator. This delusion is so strong because it's created by the creator. So all of the people on the left at, that were at the, uh, the Battle of Charlottesville, you're being duped by Yahweh, and you're not smarter than Yahweh. <laughs> you are, no matter what you do, no matter what you think, none of us at all are in any way smarter. You're not going to outsmart Yahweh with communism. If your thing is communism, you're not going to outsmart him with communism. If your thing is the U.S. Constitution, you're not going to outsmart him with the U.S. Constitution, <laughs> right? So anyway, surrender. I'll let Jim pick it up. Uh, and um, good morning, face the world. Who, who, who are we fighting here? Well, <laughs> this age-old story of good and evil. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, as he was talking, I, I'm not familiar with the episode, though. I'm sure I've seen it 30 years ago, as I've seen every episode. And, um, you know, I love Ray Broad Bradbury's work. Uh, Gene, hold on. Ray Bradbury, different fiction author, sci-fi. But I love his work, Kurt Vonnegut's work. Um, you know, Gene Roddenberry. You know, so everything is just so rich with allegory. And, you know, the simple allegory captured is that it's good versus evil. And wh whatever you focus on and, and feast upon, that which you put in your heart, whether it's jealousy or envy or covetousness or, you know, any of those things that, um, in essence, are a negative energy, um, yeah, our, our enemy grows. And uh, what's the old uh, the old Indian proverb that there was um, an Indian chief that said to the young buck who got his name and was going to join his first tribal hunt and the ritual of becoming a man. And the chief took the young buck aside and, and he said to him, he said, you know, never forget that inside your own soul are two warriors that hunt each other. There is, you know, a white dog and a black dog, and they both live inside your soul. And uh, the young buck asks the elder, he goes, you know, which one wins? He goes, well, the one you feed the most. And, and it's a simple story, but um, it's absolute true. That's why the word is so full of encouragement. You know, think on these things, focus on these things. Um, it, it steers and guides the heart of the things which give us energy and strength and peace and uh, are encouraging to us versus the things that, that sap our energy and uh, frustrate us, uh, cause us disappointments. You know, nearly every disappointment comes from one or two positions. You know, it's false expectations or bad information. And, um, you know, while we could argue the the details about how much of the written word <laughs> has bad information. Um, you know, that's another argument into itself. The account, the written account with all versions combined, it is enough of the written historical account for us to identify, you know, who the enemies are, what the pattern is. And, and it's been the same old pattern since the beginning of time, since, um, you know, the literal Garden of Eden, the literal Adam and Eve. Here they were in fellowship with their creator, our father. They were at peace. And the thing that brought division between them <clears throat> was believing a lie, was entertaining a thought that was contrary to our creator's best purpose and intention for us. And, you know, that is the pattern that uh, unfolds throughout all life. And, you know, when we go through this world living and from moment to moment and event to event, the things that change us, the things that shape us, 
Um, that's what all of these things are for, is to uh, build character, build strength, and sharpen our focus to the things that really matter. And, um, you know, when we just become so worn out of chasing the world and all of its vain illusions, and, and we quit buying the BS about, you know, what we should have and what we should wear, and and, and, you know, to be acceptable and status and culture and all these silly, vain things that bring so much strife. When, when we begin to get back to the basics and focus on Him and what He would have us do with our life that would bring glory and honor to Him, um, that's when we find the peace. And that's when we quit getting duped. <laughs> and it's like the old carrot on a stick. You know, you lead the horse around with the, with the promise of the carrot. And that's how this world is. You can't turn on the TV or the radio or any media. And it's just, you're bombarded with bad information, propaganda, and consumerism. You know, buy this. You need this. Sale now. This weekend only. And it's just a perpetual uh, leading astray like the Pied Piper. And, you know, that's the voice of this world. It wants us wasting our energy. It wants us living in vain. Uh, once it's divided, once it's fighting over things that are, are really irrelevant. And, you know, what went on in Charlottesville recently, it, it's completely irrelevant. Um, I, I'm not too familiar with the details. I know there was some white supremacy thing going on and <clears throat> some Antifada rallies. and I, But I don't need to know the details because... I know who the enemy is, and I know his game. <laughs> it's the same old, same old man. You know, he, he you tries a, to marginalize you. You had a good analogy with the, the, if you played the Packers during the '60s, what they would just go power sweep right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. They just do this. It's the, the, the bankers do the exact same thing over and over yeah. and over yeah. again. Yeah, they've got this one play down pat. They've mastered it. They know where to set the players. They know where to run the ball. And, and they do. It's just um, dive play, right side, until you stop me. And it's, you know, three yards and a cloud of dust for 60 minutes. And it's not glorious. It's simple. Um, but it works. And the reason it works is because, you know, the children of God, they... They haven't really awakened as to their potential in Him. And, you know, it, myself, I'll say they, myself, struggle with double-mindedness. Like right now, I've, I've got a vehicle situation where uh, the transmission went out. And I'm glad I have friends enough that could, you know, give me a loaner. I'm driving a loaner right now from a friend's extra vehicle while I'm looking for another one. And these things just weigh on you. You know, transportation, how am I going to get around? Uh, will I find a vehicle that's dependable? or is it? Because I've only had this Explorer. I put like maybe 4,000 miles on it. And it ran great when I got it. And it's, it's still got a good motor. But boom, you know, the tranny shot. I was hoping it was a torque converter, but that's not the case. Anyway, it is what it is. And, you know, everything in this world is wood, hay, and stubble. It, it's all going to deteriorate. It's all going to crumble. What are the things that rem remain? What are the things that matter? Well, if you read the words of Yeshua, His only begotten Son, it says in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, He said, you know, the things that remain are the things we do in Him. Those are the things that remain. And the, and the apostles reminded us uh, that over and over uh, in, in Peter's epistles, St. Uh, Paul's writing, or Apostle Paul's writing, you know, we're reminded not to get too caught up in this theater we call life, these carnal things, these fleshly things. Um, this is just the classroom. Everything around here in this world is a classroom. No matter where you're at, what country you're in, what nationality you're from, where you're born, life is an opportunity for us to learn who we are, how we overcome, what our purpose is, and that we are not alone. That His Spirit is calling His bride home. His Spirit, without prejudice, 
without any predisposition other than the 144,000, the remnant that he promised to save, uh, other than the remnant from the original promises of Ab to Abraham that will be set aside to keep his promise and covenant with Abraham, other than that, this whole world. So I don't get caught up in who's a Jew or who's not a Jew or what even a Jew really is or whether you're a Buddhist or a Christian. I don't think most Christians even really understand what it means to follow Christ. I, I just don't. Uh, I think they're caught up in a, a term the Hebrew roots people like to use, pounders and those guys, churchianity. And that, that's a solid word. And it means that you've been plugged into the system so long that you're just going through the motions. There's no daily interaction, rhema word, living word, impartation from the Holy Spirit. And yet, while I slept last night, God's Holy Spirit didn't sleep. Uh, when I woke this morning, the Holy Spirit was already awake and waiting. It says that His Spirit covers the face of the earth. It, and, and, you know, when you read the book of um, Genesis, and it tells you that His Spirit covers the face of the earth. And it, it's in all things, all living things. That is the essence of life. So if we're living things, and that which we are seeking, trying to figure out, our quest, if you will, is a spiritual journey, we might just want to seek the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We might just want to, you know, request and ask of God, who says, you know, ask anything of your father, you know, he'll spare you no good thing, because your earthly fathers give good things to their sons. How much more will your heavenly father give good things to his own who ask of him? And, and this is the truth. So no matter what you're facing today, whether it's transportation issues, or your wife, or your husband, or your teenage kid, and I've had a bunch of those, <laughs> they're all grown now, no, no matter what plight it is, can't pay your power bill, you're going to be cut off, no water, these things, this provision, this strife, these things pass, and, and I would say stand, stand in the faith, stand in the promises, and render yourself, commit yourself to something greater than yourself, you know, his will and his purpose. There's no re reason to be caught up in all these uh, schisms. And I, don't know, I, mean, how, I don't know how many thousands of varieties of quote-unquote Christianity there is anymore. I, you know, I know the few basic ones, you know, Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians. I, I mean, I, I get that. But beyond that, there's just hundreds and hundreds of more of these idio little syncrasies, these tiny little differences that, and that's the same thing you had back in the days of when Jesus walked the earth. Yeshua was teaching and calling out the so-called teachers, the chief priests, the elders. He was calling them out because that's what they did. They quibbled over these silly, minute details that was their own vanity, you know. Well, I don't eat pork, or I don't touch alcohol. You know, shove all that up your whatever. That's your righteousness right there. Your righteousness comes from God's grace alone. Now, I'm not mocking his law, but I'm telling you that even if you fulfilled the law, which no man can, even if you did, you'd have no righteousness in that. You wouldn't. It's a thing of the heart. Do you you desire to be reunited with your father. Some of you are long lost. You've been adopted by foster parents called state or uh, American citizenship or Israeli citizenship or, or whatever corporate entity that has you bound over in captivity through the birth certificate and the identity and all these things and all your national status. That matters nothing. Our identity is in Him. We have one Father, one, one Creator. And he, yet we know these things, yet struggle with polytheism. That we believe that, yet we slowly, and I'm speaking to myself, let these other gods creep in. And, you know, it doesn't take much to feed a small thing for it to grow. 
and that's why I constantly keep myself in check. That's why I enjoy being surrounded by people like Wayne, who I know as hard as after the Lord, and many other brothers. I could shout out a dozen of you right now, but I know, I know you personally. I know your heart is after the Lord. I know that you're not uh, arrogant, unteachable, and I trust you to to speak into my life, as so many of you have over the years. And that's what we're to do to one another. We're to truly befriend one another and to speak into each other's lives, whether it's black, white, male, female, Jew, Greek. Now, again, none of these things matter. What matters is, are we, are we working our way back home? Have we answered the calling of him that is drawing us unto him again, the restoration? Are you part of the restoration? Or are you part of the schism and the fracture and the fractures that are occurring all over the world? Um, but back to this whole Charlottesville thing, I, I don't even care about it at all because I know who's behind it. it it's the same old Edomites, the same old uh, enemies of God's children, the one that was cut off, Esau, and has been duping and deceiving and outwitting and just contending with the true Israelites, Jacob and his tribe, from the very beginning. That's the strife. That is the origins of all of this uh, wickedness. It can all be traced back to that. So see the enemy for who he is, what it is, and just remain teachable. Uh, don't think that you've arrived to some high lofty knowledge that, that you're now a teacher. <laughs> you know, even as Christ said, he goes, don't let any of you be anxious to teach. Uh, and, and again, Apostle Paul says that you that are teachers and call yourselves teachers, even though indeed you are, he says, whether you really are or not is not the point. As soon as you declare yourself and put it out there, you're going to be held to a higher standard. And, and rightly so. Um, we've lost the, the art of eldership in our communities. We have, we have, we've lost our communities. <laughs> There's hardly any communities anymore at all. And this is unnatural. What is natural is for us to live in symbiotic harmony. You know, and that's one of the beautiful things I love about what Wayne's promoting with the uh, barter script and the mountain hours and the exodus hours in the alternative currency because so much of it lies on the bonds and integrity of those that are working and building the wealth and building the assets. And that's how it was meant to be from the beginning. Uh, we are to be our brother's keeper. We are to help one another along. You know, this, this competition and this... Um, divisiveness uh, um, there, there's nothing good in that you know I struggle with this personally you know seeing the good in all people expecting the best in all people hoping for the best in all people and uh, you know when I'm disappointed I have to remind myself of the times that I've disappointed my own self even my own standards um, I've disappointed my father and that's why it's important to keep fellowship with like-minded, hard-after-God people, because they'll discern that in you. They'll say, hey, brother, what's wrong? What's got you down? What's pulling you into the quagmire? What's sinking you right now? Let's, let's stand in agreement right now that this thing is not greater than the faith he's placed in you, and that precious faith that he's placed in you is the most valuable thing in all the earth, is him proving what he's made proving, testing of the character, the proving of the character. There's no victory in second place, people. There's no joy in that. There's there's no wonderful elation of shoulda, coulda, woulda. The glory comes at the victors, and he has made us more than conquerors. We are more than overcomers. If we do not lose faith, if we do not shrink back, if we do not grow weak and fall away, we are to hold on to him, that anchor of our soul, that compass within us that continually draws us north, if you will, again, using another navigational metaphor. 
But it is, the Holy Spirit is like the North Star, and we're upon the seas of this life. And we have our sextant, you know, the tangible, the written word. Uh, we have all the wisdom that he's given us to get through this life. And as we travel, we're always coming back and ch checking, just like, you know, a captain using a sextant is always checking his position in relation to the North Star. We are to freely be transparent with one another. Um, you know, Wayne busts my chops all the time for having alcohol, enjoying beer. Yeah, guilty. Um, <laughs> things like this. And he does it in love. Um, he's suffered with family members and, and alcoholism, as I have. You know, there's so many alcoholics in my uh, family, many of which are already dead. You know, the that disease, that sickness, that addiction took them under and they died young premature deaths and so I get that you know eat healthy take care of your temple preserve fight the good fight you know put in as many days of service as you possibly can that is what we should be doing to encourage one another but by the same token um, we're also uh, to be humble and and not be overly zealous uh, with victories. Um, you know, my victory over sex addiction, that's a big deal. <laughs> I mean, as a teenager, uh, I became just like every other little Babylonian heathen, uh, sexually active, and my parents kind of came into adulthood at the end of the 50s and uh, began the family in the early 60s. And they were part of that whole hippie culture thing, you know, free love, and, you know, I laugh looking back at the pictures of my dad and his his tie-dye afghan and his hippie hair and his long hippie beard, and, you know, it cracks me up, the elephant pants and, and, and the platform shoes and all these silly cultural things. Let me tell you, um, squandering your life away on hedonism, <clears throat> that's not a new cultural thing. <clears throat> that's not some... <clears throat> cultural era of significance unique to America. Sodom and Gomorrah is yeah. pretty old. Yeah, Sodom and Gomorrah <laughs> go way, way back. Um, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, so that, that's, I was making yeah. the point about um, we the prophets are called and commanded to return the hearts of the fathers to their sons. Right, that's right? correct. And so what I was saying is like you know, all this conflict that's going on right now. So if you're on the right uh, of the uh, Charlottesville thing, mo I would say most of those people are, are probably constitutionalists, right? So what you're saying is you value the Constitution more than a future of peace in the garden for your children, mm. right? Or if you go to the left because they're all about, you know, gay rights and, and uh, uh, what, what is their mean political, uh, they're against the Nazis, right? Um, black Lives Matter. Well, if you truly care about black lives, right, if you truly, truly care about black lives, right, then give them their own homeland and let's cooperate and like, let's get Rothschild out of Africa. Well, that's a good point. That's an excellent point. Yeah, again, you know, who, who's the meddler? <laughs> who's the interloper? Who's the middle man in this uh, transaction we call life? In every transaction here in this Western culture with the Federal Reserve Banking System, the Central Bank System, the World Bank System, the IMF, it, you know, who is the meddler? Who is the one that is um, monetizing the, our very lives? Again, it's, it's the same old money changers, the same ones that... Who's the slave master? Yeah, the only begotten son <laughs> took a whip and beat from the temple. Uh -huh. I mean, you think they care about you? You think they respect you? Granted, they'll go to your temple. They'll sit in your synagogues right alongside you. They'll participate in these uh, <clears throat> worship services and... <clears throat> public relations. Yeah, it is. It's marketing. It's public relations. Meanwhile, they, they're sitting right beside you in this same fellowship... And they're preying upon you. They're parasiting it. 
They smile at you, they shake your hand, they pat you on the back, they ask, how your mama? How's your wife and kids? As if they really care. They are preying upon us. And there's no mystery as to who it is. It's, it's the bankers, it's the bankers, it's the bankers. And <laughs> that's who's preying upon us. You think, think of usury. Usury is non-stop extraction of money from the poor to the rich. That's the fact. By definition. Yeah. So Yahweh's law says no usury. So how many people, how many people in the Black Lives Movement are promoting the abolition of usury? Right. That's a good question. How many people are pointing out that the, the think, bankers... The answer is close to zero. <laughs> Just a hunch. <laughs> and by the way, on the right as well. How many people, you know, if you look at the leadership of the uh, alternate right, you know, right, they're, they're, the initial event was unite the right, um, and they have, like, true things. White people are being deliberately genocided, just like black people are being deliberately genocided. That's a fact. What is the chief tool of that genocide? The primary tool, the primary, what is the root of all evil? The weaponization of usury. It's yeah. the weaponization of, of the love of money. Right. Uh, that, that these are biblical, absolute facts. Jesus didn't pick a whole. Jesus didn't whip Caesar. Right. Jesus didn't whip the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus did not whip the tax collector. No. Jesus did not whip the black people. He didn't whip the white people. He whipped the money lenders. All right. And that's a, that's an excellent point, Matthew. One of his followers, one of the twelve, the originally chosen. His occupation, his trade, was a tax collector. And yet, here, the love and forgiveness and understanding of the only begotten Son is displayed. He separated that person from the occupation. He, in all wisdom, knows and sees it's the system that's killing us. It's the system that's destroying us. It's the system that's alienating us, causing us to compete with one another and literally tear each other down rather than build one another up. And, you know, in the Western culture, there's this constant narrative, every evening news about the budget and these welfare people and these aliens and, and um, the news, a mouthpiece for the kingdom of darkness really there's nothing good in that but the news the media they're constantly keeping this in the narrative they're constantly keeping a keeping it current about the budget and and who gets so much of the of the US budget and how much of the taxpayers money goes to this goes to that goes to this goes to that but the one mega portion that never seems to shrink is the military the warring budget the budget to steal, kill, and destroy. Uh, that is by far the lion's share of the budget. And, and that ought to tell you something about the nature of the system. That its biggest um, sector of the budget is not for quote-unquote self-defense, national defense. That's all brilliant marketing. I mean, really, when's the last time these shores were attacked? Was it 1812? <laughs> I think that's correct. And some of you are going to right away, oh, Pearl Harbor, oh, get over that nonsense, man. Go read, your, go read your history books. Hawaii was not a U.S. state. Uh, Hawaii was just some country that the U.S. happened to roll upon and claim by conquest and force and violence and theft. It didn't become a state until 1950. See, 1950 is after December 7, 1941, for those of you bad with math. See how that works? So don't buy the lie. U.S. wasn't attacked in Pearl Harbor. It's just another charade, another screenplay, another script being played out to prey upon the earth. All the kingdom of the earth suffers violence. We are all being preyed upon. It's not a black thing, white thing, Jew thing, Gentile thing, Greek thing. Um, it's, it is all living things are being preyed upon by the very same enemy. These vain, godless, Luciferian, um, 
powers that control the credit, the lending, the money supply, the currency, commerce. They are the, the kings of commerce. And there is no equal. They are continuing to build as they have been for hundreds of years, for sure, undeniably hundreds of years. Um, they are building a one world government. You know, the whole League of Nations, which became the United Nations, which, you know, the UN. Um, this is all part of their godless system. In their vanity, they think that they can create a utopian society where, you know, we'll reach that, uh, that symbiosis with the right amount of people. And they'll call the Guidestones. Talk about what the optimum, the optimum population would be on the planet earth you know and and their vanity what is it 500 million i think it was 500 it was million the guidestones you know this this luciferian uh declaration of reason <laughs> yeah the no, age like, of very reason. rational they've declared it that right now six and a half billion of us gotta go <laughs> yeah. we gotta go um so it will be utopia and nirvana and harmony for the 500 million that get to remain. This is as, as wicked and as vain as it gets. And that's the mindset of these authority figures that you're told to respect as government, um, as your wise elders. Again, the, the organic natural system of community and elders that has all but disappeared and it's been replaced with Caesar and his governors and his outpost of um, you know infantry and tanks <laughs> and uh, air bases with bombs um, and again like Wayne was saying the technology you know the technology is is there's things that we haven't even been made aware of. And again, uh, the John Pounders guys, they're into a lot of that. The nanobots, the, um, you know, the micro robotic technology. There's things that would just blow the, the common person's mind of what they're able to obtain and accomplish uh, through technology. But it's, it's not technology we're to fear. And we're, matter of fact, in him, we're not to fear anything. But rather, the enemy is the spirit that has set itself against our Almighty Father. The spirit that thinks that it has a better way than his way. That their way uh, is more humane. Again, like Wayne had mentioned, the age of reason. That, you know, through the, through the age of reason, through uh, humanism, basically, where you elevate yourself above your creator as if you think you are your own God, you are your own salvation. And they truly believe that. These uh, global elitists, which run and control all these governments of the world, and control the commerce, and decide which uh, kingdoms rise and fall, uh, which ones get absorbed, and which ones get strengthened and encouraged, those, those folks, you know, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, um, the G20, the Doha Roundtables. Um, it's all about mercantilism. And so, the, you know, they want to exploit us and run a more efficient animal farm. That's their goal. They just want the most efficient animal farm. Well, they'll have just enough worker bees to keep the honey flowing, but not enough worker bees that they need to bother caring for or looking after because they don't really care about anything. To, to them, uh, we're just a necessary evil, <laughs> you know? And they wouldn't think twice, again, about wiping out six billion of us. Um, and they've declared as much, again, going back to the Guidestones. So, yeah, um, to bring this full circle back to the episode that uh, I'm kind of familiar with now that I think about it, I have seen that. You know, that's the excellent point. What is this this thing that is uh, dividing us? Um, well, it's your own vain ambitions. It's, it's your own um, egocentrical 
quest. <laughs> um, yet, what is love? Well, his word says that no greater love is this, that you lay your life down for another. And, you know, whether it's all getting together and laugh so the orb shrinks, or, you know, coming into agreement that we human lives are the most important part of this world and that in order to uh, care for one another that we need to rid ourselves of the parasites rid ourselves of the ones that are polluting our water supply polluting our air deliberately deliberately these governments deliberately dump toxins into the atmosphere and into the ocean um, and when I was very uh, active as an environmental contractor and uh, land restoration specialist, um, <laughs> we occasionally would come across illegal dumping um, containers of who knows what, acid, motor oil, burnt motor oil, I mean drums and stuff just dumped into the woods, dumped into these wetlands. And um, one of the themes that, you know, these experts... Uh, said over and over and over that dilution is the solution to pollution that was their their go-to phrase dilution is the solution to pollution and that's you know they actually gave out handbooks on how to handle it how to keep it in concentrated form how to wrap it in all these containers and liners and, and, and um, keep it from leaking or whatever how to transport it again in double line triple line hulls and they got all this system and ironically to what so they could get it to a port put it on a barge take it out in the ocean and dump it <laughs> true story okay we've got a better trash pile over here than over there i mean they are literally dumping unknown toxins in these man-made compounds that are artificial that are synthetic they're literally dumping them in our waters, in the atmosphere. You know, they don't care. Again, they don't care about anything sacred. But yet, we should. We should. We should be stewards of our tribes. We should be stewards of our land. And we should be accountable to one another um, in the things that we value and the things that we praise and esteem and honor. You know, let the things that are esteemed among us be one another. Let the things that we want to grow and cultivate be life and not death. Um, that is the essence of what he made us to be. Um, and, and there's so many metaphors throughout the written word about, you know, consider the lilies of the field, consider the sparrows, you know, reflect on nature. These things don't strive. There's no striving in these natural systems. Um, and yet, you know, the seeds keep germinating and the vegetation keeps growing and, and these plants keep making oxygen. Um, and there are sections uh, in this civilization that become, they're called brown fields where the pollution has become so saturated into the ground um, that it's simply unfit uh, to grow anything or even be near because of the uh, toxicity, the radioactivity. Um, the, we are destroying. Um, coffee was another thing, you know, you know uh, Wayne sent me a thing about coffee. And coffee's one of those strange subjects that you know, every few months you'll read opposing views that it it's great about antioxidant and then it, oh, it destroys you and it tears your organs. I mean, so I guess it depends on who's funding the research is, you know, the answer you're going to get. But the point is that the coffee demand is, is truly is wiping out the rainforest. I, I read uh, not too long ago that it was like 1.8 million acres, 1.8 million acres has been cleared and wiped out to, to grow more coffee. Um, regardless of the effect of coffee on your body, I would say the demand for coffee is having a very dire consequence on the face of the earth. Um, maybe just chew some tea leaves or something, folks. There's got to be a better way. 
And we'll never get to manage and be stewards of the better way until we eliminate and rid ourselves of these parasites, the usurers, the global elites, the ones running the government. The ones that many of you proudly get out your little voter ID card and stand in line to support. Go figure. You know, as if there's voting in the kingdom of heaven. As if, you know, Almighty's looking down, you know, are the are the ballots tallied yet? What must I do? <laughs> I mean, who are we kidding here? Get over yourself. Uh, all of your voting is not going to affect the will of our Father, nor His nature, nor His end goal. Not one iota. All of your voting is, is vanity compared to the will of God. It's foolishness. So you can pretend that you're taking part you can pretend that your little exercise in futility actually means something and that you are affecting positive change when you stand and vote for these representatives. Now think about that. You can present yourself before our Father, which is what the Word says repeatedly. That's a theme. Present yourself before your Father. Present yourself. Well, why should you? Stay at home. You can be represented. <laughs> Representative? Represented? Really? How are you going to answer when you're called to give an account for what you did with your life? Well, I voted for this guy who had my back. He covered all that. He dotted all my I's and crossed all my T's and, hey, I'm not culpable. He's culpable. <laughs> no, wrong. You need to understand the word. You need to understand his kingdom. You need to understand the true law. And ignorance of the law is not a valid excuse from prosecution. It's not a valid defense. Every person will give an account for the things they did and did not do, including myself, will give an account. There will be an audit of your life. There will be a reckoning. There will be rewards and there will be punishment. And this is natural. This is divine. This is the will of the Father. These are the things He's put in motion in His creation. So, pull away from this artificial crap. Don't get caught up in the, the headlines. Don't get caught up in the sound bites. Don't get caught up in the theater. We know who the players are. We know what their end goal is. Divide and conquer. Still kill and destroy. Divide and conquer. Still kill, destroy. All right, and we say it again. It's not complicated. It's ABC one two three. Power sweep. Left. It's power sweep left. Power sweep right. They're gonna run the same old simple play until you stop them. And here's how you stop them: withdraw your consent. As the only begotten Son said to the crowd, and even his followers that came. And you know they're saying all these things about you. You're the you're you're the miracle worker. You're the Messiah. Some say that you're really Beelzebub, that you're a devil, and you cast out these demonic spirits, you know, because you have devil powers. You know, so they, everyone's coming. And do you know what the simple reply was? Whom do you say that I am? Whom do you say that I am? And I ask you, who do you say? Who do you know? Or, and be honest. If you don't know, just say, I don't know. I've, I have not resolved this in my mind to know who Jesus, Yeshua, the only begotten Son, the Messiah, who He is. His purpose for coming in the flesh. His purpose for blood sacrifice upon a cross. His purpose for bringing... Um, grace, forgiveness, and reminding the teachers of the law what the spirit of the law truly is about. So, I would encourage you to answer that question. If you've not resolved in your own mind, beyond a shadow of a doubt, who he is, uh, that's the greatest thing you can do today, is to spend time you know, sorting that out in your own mind. Who is this Jesus, this Yahshua, this Yehovah, this Christ, the Anointed One, the Redeemer? Who is He? 
Um, because once you know that, everything else just falls at your feet. Everything else becomes minor and, and um, of no real influence. It's, it's minutia. Uh, the things that matter are the things that please Him, the things that do Him. Give Him glory. Um, expose the darkness. That's what Wayne and I try to do, hopefully accomplish every day of our life. We're thinking, we're seeing, we're looking always on watch. That's what the watchmen do. We're always on watch of the things that are preying upon us, the things that are sniping us, taking us out one at a time, taking us out in groups, um, calling us. And we're not fear-mongering. We're not just, you know, shouting fire, fire, fire. We're saying, yeah, there's fire, but this is who it's coming from, and this is why. And we have fire, too. Just as this wicked world has fire that destroys, so we and him also have a holy fire. How about Elijah? A chariot of fire. My man. I can't wait to see that on another subject. I want to see the hot wheels of heaven, Elijah's chariot. But we have a holy fire, a holy anointing. A truth that burns away every lie, every deception. It undresses them. And it gives us the courage to say, you know, the emperor's naked. Not only is he naked, but he's a pedophile. He's a thief. He's an adulterer. <laughs> um, that's the fire in us. That's the fire we have. It tears down the idols within us. It exposes the idols in our culture. And um, strengthens us. And um, it's like that light, that vision ever present before us, drawing us continually to Him. That's the holy fire. So, you know, you want to have fun? <clears throat> Join in a little pyro action, metaphorically speaking. You know, which fire do you want to be a part of? The fire that burns away the wickedness? The fire that exposes the lies and the destruction for what it truly is? Um, or do you want to be part of... Uh, this wildfire on earth, this forest fire that's destroying everything natural, everything holy, and everything godly. Um, you know, and you can be a sellout. It pays well. If you, if there's a lot of peace in being a sellout, a government flunky going along to get along. <clears throat> this walk of truth is is not an easy one. This walk of truth, it's not all joy and and high fives and and birthday cakes and candles and <laughs> and wonderful songs and kumbaya it is a long as in eternal never ending until the return until the restoration of all things until that time it's 24/7 365 uh, this spirit of darkness this calling of his anointed this slaughter of his holy children this destruction of the innocent it's non-stop, 24-7. When I woke up this morning, uh, evil hated me. <laughs> evil hated me simply because of my uh, my birth name. My born again birth name. My name in him. Evil hated me because I've made a choice. I know whom I serve. I know who I call father. I know who I put my trust. I know whom I fear. The one, the one I fear one and one only. Um, you know, there's this kind of a dramatic moment in the the book, in the movie. There's been several movies, I think, called The Count of Monte Cristo, where Edmond Dantes, uh, you know, the, the main character, the protagonist throughout the story, that he meets his son, a son that he never knew he had. And he's giving the toast at this son's 16th birthday. It's coming into the manhood. Um, and, and he set it up to be there and to become a part of that. And so it, <laughs> this young man is, is kidnapped and he's, and he's put to the sword. And these bad guys are, are threatening him and trying to rattle his cage. And, um, you know, 
this young guy, because he's a count, the son of a count, and he's nobility, and these are just street rat rogues, he says, do your worst. Do your worst. Because he had been raised in a spoiled life, knowing no fear. Every need, every desire um, was provided for. And not in a hedonist sense, not to encourage hedonism or licentiousness or vanity of the flesh, but in the same way, in the spiritual realm, we are royalty. We are counts. We are priests. We are priestesses. We are holy and anointed, set apart for his purpose and his goodwill. We are ambassadors throughout this world, bringing good relations, good tidings, good news, declaring the jubilee, declaring the healings, declaring the deliverance, declaring the provision. The world says, there's not enough. He says, it's already there. You're just not seeing it. I've already provided for you. The world says, I need. The truth is, he's provided. He has provided. And he makes the provision known through the ambassadors, through the prophets, through the priests, through the priestesses, through the prophetesses, through the quote-unquote seers, um, those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. That is how he makes the provision known. Debt, national debt, means nothing to me. Why should the national debt mean anything to me? It's all fiction. <laughs> it's a bunch of accounting magic, black magic voodoo <laughs> by, you know, a bunch of godless usurers and usurpers who've come up with some magic system. <laughs> and it is. There's nothing real about it. It takes your faith and belief to give it life. <laughs> it does. If you stop supporting it with your faith and belief, it crumbles, it withers and blows away. It ceases to exist because it's unnatural. The only reason it remains is through deception. You have been tricked into believing it's real. You have been brainwashed into living and serving something that is godless government, pharaoh, king, president, constitution, whatever it is. If you are not living and seeking and, and growing daily in your understanding and love and, and strength and power of Him and His will, the Most High, you're living your life in vain. None of it will matter. When you get to heaven, you know, there will be General Motors giving you your 20 years of service little decal, you know, to stick on your lapel. <laughs> it's ridiculous. These, I, I'm, I'm being absurd because that thinking is absurd. That all your service in these man systems is somehow going to benefit you. Well, it will to some degree, but not for eternal purposes, not for the things that matter throughout all eternity. They don't mean a, a hill of beans. So again, it goes back to the very simple. What's the, what's the first commission? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things that you strive about, all these things that you worry about, all these things that you quarrel over, that you fight over, that you kill one another for, <laughs> these things will be provided unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Anyway, so thank you for listening to uh, my sermon this day, the things on my heart. Um, be blessed in him. And uh, I'm sure my, uh, Wayne has many more things to say. He's over here pondering. I can see his wheels turning. I so we'll let him share. Yes. And um, I'll pull up the job site. Again, back to Wayne. All right. So uh, Anthony LaRocca. What's up, brother? Um, <clears throat> um we're getting close to our job, uh, but please watch the, the Star Trek episode of uh, Day of the Dove. We got this alien. The orb is growing in power as we hate. Let's just uh, just see if, you know, Spock called it out. He, Spock saw the magic trick. When we hate, the orb gets bigger. Rothschild's power grows. 
when we laugh at it, it shrinks. When we unite and laugh at it, it goes away. So the way we unite and laugh at it is through the Jubilee. We party, we sing, we celebrate our independence from Babylon. <clears throat> we forgive each other's debts. And that's how we we overcome that. And we can we can issue our own money based upon biblical law without usury. We will lend to many nations, as it says in uh, Deuteronomy 28, uh, without usury, without scarcity, without monopoly. Uh, uh, so it's possible to overcome this. It's it's just a magician's trick. This whole thing is just the magician's trick. And we're all punked by it. And it's just blustering. It's, it's the Wizard of Oz sorcery that we're believing a lie. That's all that's going on. That's exactly right. And the, the, and the Constitution's the same thing. The Constitution was just sorcery. It was black magic, just like Hollywood. The Constitution is no more holy than... Uh, the Communist Manifesto. The, con the, the Communist <laughs> Manifesto and the Constitution were written by the same guys. Right. Exactly. Right? So what happens is the Constitutionalists look at the at the Communist Manifesto, oh, look at those evil. We got to wrap all of our faith into the Constitution. No, put it all into the King's Law, the Creator's Law. <clears throat> and that creates a, a tribal government, judges of tens, fifties, hundreds, and thousands. We forgive all debt. We issue our own money. We live self-sufficiently on the land. And all of this will be like a just a I, I just uh, imagine if you were ever a vict you know a victim of an episode of punk where you go ah you got me ah you got me we were just gotten we just got tricked so what is the biggest way we we refuse to see how we're being tricked like if a wife is cheating on a husband the hus the, the husband won't hear like if the buddy goes to the hey dude your wife's cheating I saw her riding he's at she has at a restaurant with some guy they're going to a hotel. What happens when you go to tell that guy? He wants to kill the messenger. He doesn't want to hear it. His, he can't even fathom it. They've got three kids. Like, I can't even wrap my... I, they won't hear it. So what do they do? They go after the messenger. Right? Well, who they kill? Jesus. Who's he? The messenger. To come tell you the truth. Who are the prophets? They're the messengers. Right? They're just saying, hey, you got punked. We all got... All of us. I got punked. Yeah. They totally punked me. I thought Ron Paul was the way. No. I thought the Constitution was the way. No. Wrong. Punked. So drop your ego. Your wife's cheating on you. Uh, uh, you know, that's how Yahweh views this whole thing. His wife is cheating on him. And the way his wife stops cheating on him is by becoming a monotheist. So that's all for today. Thanks for listening, guys.